interesting. Can't believe hey. it. Gareth, how are you doing, man? That was a surprise. Like, whoa. <laughs> you disappeared out of nowhere. Awesome. Awesome, man. Welcome to the channel. Really appreciate you are here. Oh, of course. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I have a lot of people here telling, saying a lot of good things about you. They wanted to see your views. What's going on? What is happening? And uh, I do too. I do too, man. So I'm really excited about this. Nice. So uh, just for the people that don't know you, right? Mm -hmm. And I hate to say this, but uh, I, I hate people saying, oh, who are you? What do you do? No, but I'll tell you, I'll, I'll do it a little bit differently this time. Uh, why should people listen? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's the tough one, right? Well, I mean, I like to think that I give a balanced approach without hype, kind of talking about logical approaches to investing and ideas that make sense in reality. So, so I, I think that for the most part, I keep people from getting caught up in the Bitcoin hype, for instance, when it was at 65,000 and vice versa. When, I, when it finally bottoms out, I think there's going to be a lot of fear and I think, you know, I'll be the one stepping up. I don't mind being the first in the door. I'll take the firing squad and, and I'll buy, be a buyer and people can follow me if they wish. All right, so awesome. I'm going to leave the links down to your channel down below as well on your Twitter as well. I know you're very popular. I know you've been on BitBoy Crypto a few times as well. So um, let's do, let, let me ask you this. Okay, here are my views and, and, and I want to do it this way. I want to tell you my views and I want to say if you agree and if yes, if no, why yes, why no, and so on. So I've been calling, I, I believe we're technically in the bear market ever since we broke 41K, 40K psychologicals, I like those psychologicals, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought we might get back above it, might be a little bit of a fake out, out to the downside, we did not, technically we're in the bear market. And I do believe we're gonna go back and retest the low 30s, and if we go down lower, we're gonna go down to the 20, 24K level. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, I also made the call uh, last week, well, not last week, but uh, when we are at 41K, I said, get out of leverage positions. This thing's probably going to break. Sit by orders at the 33K, 34K, and so on. We got the, there was a lucky bounce. Yeah. Are we, though, in a bear market? Do you think we are technically in a bear market or not? Because there's two different views on this. What's yours? Yeah. So, so I, I do think we're in a bear market. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense to be in a bear market considering you have the four year cycle in Bitcoin. Um, again, it was created in 2009, 2013 was kind of that first bubble blow off where it had an 80% drop. 2017, four years later, it had the next blow off and here we are in 2021. So at least in terms of cycles, a four year cycle makes sense right now. I also think a couple of things that, that kind of jump out at me, number one, when we were hitting 65 to 69,000 in October and early November, what I noticed was that the hype, and, I, and I'm on Twitter, so I see the hype all the time, but the hype was way more than even when we were at the 65,000 in April. And so usually what you look for is, is when that hype is even more intense, but the price is not significantly higher, it's a negative indicator. It's a negative divergence, mm. all right? Because again, the hype can only go so, so far. You can only get so many smaller investors to buy in, and it was kind of maximum at that point. So what it told us was that institutions or bigger money was selling into that at that point. So it, they played it so well too, right? They pierced the high of 65,000 from April. They made everyone think it was breaking out. Um, it, it happened just at the launch of the ETF for futures. What's interesting about that is that in 2017, the high matched up perfectly with yeah. the hype going into the actual futures launch on Bitcoin. So, so these type of things, I mean, it's amazing how history, it doesn't necessarily repeat, but it rhymes really closely. Um, and again, I'm in the camp that we are in a bear market. Do you think you could let me share my, my charts by any yeah, chance? Yeah, 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 would love that. I would love to show you guys some cool stuff on this. Let me just see how I can do this. Should be under Multiple settings, maybe under my name. There you go. Yeah. The... So you should be able to do it now. Perfect. Awesome. So so let me show you the chart of Bitcoin here. And, and, and one of the reasons why I think it's so fascinating. And you were talking about why it bounced at that 33,000 level. Well, take a look at this, right? So you had from the, the April high of 65 down to the low of 29. That's that distance, right? Well, interestingly enough, from 69 down to 33, it's the exact same distance. So it gave a reason why we bounced at that level. Look at how these parallel lines match up perfectly, right? So, so that's just a cool thing. I mean, it's amazing how these charts work and kind of let us into something here. Now, like you said, if, if we break this line, 
that's where I would get really concerned, right? So as long as the bulls can make a big stand here, maybe Bitcoin can actually rally up into the 40,000, maybe even higher, maybe the midpoint of this line, that would kind of be my maximum upside. But if we do break to the downside, you really don't have much to stop price until probably around 20,000 at that point. So definitely some interesting stuff here. Would you would you um, do you think we're going to have a dead cat bounce to the uh, 40 or 50 K and then go back down? Or do you think we can go back up from there and continue the bull cycle? So so I'm a huge long term bull on Bitcoin, meaning that, you know, when the dust settles, I think this goes to 500,000, maybe even higher. I think, you know, Kathy Woods has talked about, you know, one million Bitcoin. I think that's possible down the line. I do think that it has to have this this dot com washout. And again, a lot of investors, newer investors didn't trade through that. It was my early career. And it was the same thing, right? So you had you had Bitcoin and you have cryptocurrencies and blockchain, all new technology, amazing excitement, right? Well, if you go back to the late 90s, it was the dot coms, the internet, it was all new. It was gonna revolutionize the world. Same thing here. So if you look at what happened to the dot coms, you had this massive flush out where Amazon went down like 90, 95%. And a lot of the dot coms went to zero and they never recovered, right? And I think that's what we need to see in cryptocurrency where you have these meme coins, you have all this other junk out there where, you know, there's one thing to say a company is unique because it makes money and so forth. But when you just have a lot of coins that don't do anything unique, that's a concern, right? So you wipe that out and then let the best survive, right? It's almost like the Darwinian theory yeah. applied to cryptocurrency. So, so my guess is bounces at this point will ultimately lead to further downside. The leverage in the system is still so high that you need to flush that out as well. It's so high. Okay. Uh, what about the, yeah, it's also um, what, out of the out of the coins that are going to get flushed out, the ones that are not going to survive, which ones do you think, well, there are no definites, but which, yeah. but which altcoins do you think will survive and, and, will, and will make a comeback even after or during or after a bear market? Yeah, so so I definitely think Bitcoin will. And, it, and what's interesting is like Bitcoin's not super unique, right? But it's been adopted by more and more people as a store of safety, right? So kind of the digital gold. And what you see is you see a lot of institutions starting to get in that in that. And as they accept it, then the whole world will accept it as that store of safety. So I think that will survive. I would like to think Ethereum will being that it's utilized so much. I think some of the bigger coins like Solana, very interesting kind of technology there. Um, they'll survive. I would generally like if I was an investor and I am an investor and I, and I have a little bit of investments in some of the cryptos, I would spread money most heavily with Bitcoin and Ethereum, but then like a little bit on a lot of the top 20, right? Because you don't know which one ultimately will right. be the mega winner. And you'd like to have some skin in the game on that one if it's a 10 or 100 times winner at that point. But again, it, it's like you said, it is so hard to know. Technology is advancing so quickly. I mean, maybe there's a cryptocurrency we haven't even heard of yet that'll en end up being the biggest yeah. one out there. So let me ask you this. Uh, a lot of people are saying that uh, gaming tokens will go into the bear market. They're going to decouple and so on. I think they're going to go to shit as well in the bear market. What do you think? So you're, are you saying gaming tokens? Is that what yeah. you said? Yeah, gaming projects, tokens. Yeah, I mean, NFTs too, right? Right in yeah. that whole group. I mean, so there, there's a massive bubble with this stuff right now. I mean, it, it's really incredible. You can see it before your eyes with some of the, the, the buy prices on these NFTs and so forth. So I do think it is. I mean, again, when any company can create a game and then in, in put in tokens and so forth and create tokens that people can buy with real money, it, there absolutely is, is a washout effect there too. It's all part of the whole you know, stratosphere of the, the cryptocurrency and, and it will will get a washout. So, yeah, it doesn't really to me, it's it's I can't invest in that kind of stuff. I have to stick if I'm going to invest in. And again, considering I think so I am long Bitcoin right now expecting a bounce. Right. I expect a bounce at least back to the low to mid 40s. But the long term investments I got to wait on. But I will absolutely be a diversified investor for longer term in, in the top 20 cryptos. Now, so, top 20, I, I honestly can't tell you that I'm going to buy Dogecoin. I don't know if I will. Same thing. Oh, we love Doge. Other, but yeah, I mean, maybe it turns out to be the best, you know, transactional one out there. But but for me, so for me, the unique thing about cryptocurrencies and why I'm attracted to them is like the Bitcoin, which is only tw there's only 21 million. Yeah. Right. So when I look at the Federal Reserve and see them printing and printing and printing and the government spending and spending and granted the Fed's trying to pull back, but let's be honest, they'll never fully get out of the, the way. They'll have to print more at some point. 
I want to know that I can put my money in something that has an end point where there can't be more just created out of thin air. So like for me, that's the most attractive thing right now about cryptocurrencies. I don't pretend to know the ins and outs of Solana or Avalanche or these other ones. I know they're great technologies. I've heard about what Solana has done with transactions per second or whatever. But but again, it's not my forte. My forte is kind of the stock side, the 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 the, the lack of of kind of printing ability. We're going to get there in a second, actually. You brought up a good point. So uh, you're playing the balance of the 40, 45K. It's quite quite interesting. Do you think we can go back down after that? Do you think it's going to be a dead cat bounce to there? I, I'm in that camp right now. I think that, you know, it, to be honest, it's even concerning the reversal. So yesterday we got to, what, 30, 39,000. Yeah. And then the Fed comes out and just crushed cryptocurrencies. It was their during. Statement. And it, what's that? It was during as he was speaking. It was, I was actually watching and I had the charts open next to me. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it was just, it was amazing the drop there and just the collapse in that. And, and you know, it, it makes me even nervous that am I going to be wrong in even buying it here in this range? You know, I have to be honest, but I got to try to follow the charts. I try to shut off that emotional side of me and just say, okay, as long as we hold 33,000, you have to say that, okay, this is a short-term bottom until proven otherwise. So, so I'm in for a bounce here, um, but it's not, I'm not looking for back to 65,000 on this. Right. I expected for it to go down lower. Uh, on, 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 I, I didn't expect it to hold at the 30, 35, 35, 36K uh, on this bad news. And it, it is showing me that it doesn't want to go down. It, it, there's something that the people don't want it to go down. Like, I, I think charts measure psychology, right? So th mm -hmm. that is something that that's why I'm waiting. I'm doing nothing. I'm sitting on my hands. Uh, I have some positions. If we go down lower and start testing the 33K, then, yeah, just take the loss now the question yeah. is if we do that how long do you think this bear market will last a couple of weeks a couple of months to a year yeah so i mean all i can do is look historically right so if you look at 2013 from the highs there or 2017 it seemed to me like we bottomed out in about a year or so and then really there was another year of chop right where you kind of where we're between 5000 and 10000 on bitcoin in 2018 uh, 2019 into 20 and then finally we broke out to the upside and started heading back to 20000 and then obviously up to 65 to 70 so i got to just go with that at this point you know a lot of people have argued the cycles have gotten longer in terms of the bull markets I don't believe that because I think a lot of the, the, the elongating cycles are to do with the Federal Reserve printing, right? So the more money that goes into the system, it allowed for a little bit of a longer cycle, you could argue. But if the Fed is really taking that away, then you could argue that it might even be a shorter cycle going forward. So, so I mean, it was so many uncertainties with the Fed, but, um, but it really, it's, it's, a, it's a major player at this point. I mean, Bitcoin is here to stay. And, and the question here is, uh, is it going to be a, a year since the all-time highs? And which all-time highs? The first ones or the second one? I'll, I'll go with the second one, you know. So I think from November. So you're looking at, you know, maybe November-ish this year, we finally bottom out. And again, this is just, it's a pure Type guess on my part. It's hard to know exactly. But but just based on past cycles, you'd probably look at that. But then I think investors have to be ready that it could be a couple or at least another year of chop. Now, there'll be great trading opportunities in there. I mean, if you bought it 3500 after the 2007 seven, uh, 17 top, I mean, you bounce back to 10,000. Man, it's amazing uh, profit if you bought at those lows. But just be ready that you know it could take a while for this to kind of wear off and this kind of deleveraging to take place and fully get out of it. Um, what you're going to look for for me is I want to see regulation, right? So mm -hmm. I know that's kind of a scary word for the cryptocurrency area, but you have to see if you want you know retirees to invest in bitcoin if you want pension funds to invest in bitcoin pension funds have trillions and trillions of dollars and if you want hedge funds and 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 people like that you have to make it safer right i mean you know it's it's something to be said that me i had my sim card jacked at one point and people got into my crypto account my business partner had i mean there's so many this is constantly going on luckily i didn't have anything in that particular crypto oh. account at the time Thank goodness, but my business partner did, and he ended up losing. You know, I think it was thirty thousand. I don't remember how much, but I mean, it's not an insignificant sum. Um, so you have to, if you want people to really invest serious capital here, you have to make it safer. So I think you need to see some sort of regulation. The one thing I'll say on regulation is that the U.S. has now become a major player in mining. That's such a good thing because it's going to keep the politicians from really doing negative regulation. 
So I think they're going to look to protect those industries, all the jobs that are that are an offshoot of it. Now you have Microsoft buying Activision, which which is really getting into the crypto space and so forth like that as well. And that is going to make it more mainstream. And then the regulation will be absolutely, I think, a positive thing long term. Do you think stocks will also be in the bear market? Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, you know, it's it's if the Fed, as long as the Fed stays hawkish, the the market is going to deleverage from it. I mean, it was just it was free money when the Fed was just printing, 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 and now they're actually showing they have some sort of backbone. I I personally think they waited way too long to hike and and to reduce their balance sheet, and it'll cause an economic slowdown within six months. And then later in the year, what I, I wouldn't be surprised if this coordinates. But if if let's say Bitcoin bottoms out in November, it might be with the 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 economic picture globally and, and definitely domestically U.S. slowing to a point that the Fed has to start reversing and lowering mm. rates again and kind of you know boosting the economy that way. Do you think they could surprise us and do this earlier, or just keep on kicking the ball down the road? I I mean. So the problem is at this point the Fed has kind of made their bed and, and we have to all lay in it, right? So, so they're never going to be able to unwind fully from the previous cycle top, right? So if you go back to where you know interest rates were prior to where where they are now, they're never going to be able to get it out of the way. It's just it's just at this point the economy is is too levered, where if they raise interest rates and get back to those former levels, we go into a major recession in the U.S. At some point, the house of cards comes tumbling down. It's probably sooner than later, but I'm hopeful that there's still a few more years before that happens. All right. So let me ask you a few more questions, and then we're going to go take some questions on the chat, and then I want to ask you about some personal questions as well. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people got in at the top. A lot of people got 60, 65K. What kind of advice would you give to those people now that are down on their portfolio, uh, uh, big on Bitcoin, even more on altcoins? What advice would you give them here? Wow. So, so considering no one knows the future, it's hard to say at thirty-five or thirty-six thousand to exit because, again, I could be wrong that it's going sub twenty, and I wouldn't want to be, you know, responsible. And obviously, everyone needs to make their decisions on their own. What I would say is, you have two options, right? One is to suck it up and take the loss, or wait for a bounce, and then let's say we bounce back to forty-five or fifty, and then exit at that point. The other one would be to hopefully continue to work hard, make more money. And dollar cost average, right? So, so if you're like me and you believe that the end game is a hundred thousand, five hundred, maybe a million, you know, looking back on it, if you can dollar cost average as it's coming down and bring your average down, and again, you know, just just do it very methodically, right? So, be a robot. Say, okay, every month I make you know three thousand dollars or five thousand. I'm going to put five hundred of that to work no matter what on Bitcoin every single month on the first of the month. Don't think about it. Don't wait for Bitcoin to rip and make you emotional, think it's running back to the highs. Just have it preset and you'll eventually get your average down to a reasonable level um, by doing that, whether it's a year of downside we see or maybe a couple years. So I would say that that's probably the best case. Obviously, everyone has to make their own decisions, but but it's I know a lot of people bought at the high because I, I remember the hype was just incredible. Right. Yeah. What about people that are in profit right now, small profit or a lot of profit? What would you give them advice to give them? Um, I, I would honestly do the same thing, right? I mean, you don't necessarily have to add because it's not going to affect your average. But let's say you're flat on the trade right now. You bought in at 35 or 36 a while back. You know, look for look for, you know, you can you know, you can either again say, OK, I don't trust it. I don't have good clarity. So let me step back and take take it off the table. Or you can just say, all right, you know what? Every 5000 down on Bitcoin. I'll add another, you know, point whatever coins, right? And then just again over time. But again, make sure that you believe. Don't listen to anyone else. Do the research yourself. Don't listen to me. Do the research. Do you think Bitcoin has a future, right? Do you think looking at all the factors out there, make an educated decision? Because again, there's so many people that'll tell you whatever you want to hear. Uh, you need to really do that inform, you know, informational search for yourself. All right. Uh, we have a few questions from the chat right here. A lot of people are saying hi. They know you here. That's pretty cool. You have a lot of fans, man. Thank you. Will crypto market be in a 10-year bear market like Amazon bubble, or could it be a one- or two-year bear market completing the flush out? I think we already answered that's that. That's a but good this question. All right. You know what I'm going to do here? I'm going to go back. I want to go back on the monthly chart on Amazon. Let's actually take a look at this because I think that'll be helpful. Okay. Um, so what you can see here, and I'm going to have to 
scroll back here. Bear with me as I bring up. So now we're in, all right, so here we go. So this was the dot-coms, right? The big run up, you had Amazon debuting. It ran up to $112, $115, and then it got wiped out. So the high on Amazon, what's interesting, by the way, look at Amazon high and high, just like Bitcoin, yes. right? So, so that's kind of freaky right there. It's almost replicating that move. Then you had a big sell-off. The high again was on December 99 was the high, and it bottomed out in 01 september so interestingly enough about a year and a half to two years right so so kind of what you would expect from the cycle with with bitcoin now what's what's beautiful about this is that even though you didn't take out 110 for a long time to come you know if you did buy in this lower range there was a lot of upside action to be had so what this could tell us is yeah i mean you, you might be I personally don't think so because I think the Federal Reserve printing will impact how fast Bitcoin goes back up and the adoption of it. But you're right. I mean, you know, technically speaking, Amazon did not take out the highs here. Let me even see how long this was at this point. Looks like, yeah, it, it, had, it took all the way to 2009 before it took out those highs. So, so it's important. That's a great point. Um, again, if you look at just the differences, a lot of a lot of what Bitcoin is has to do with the printing of the Fed. So if you're in my camp where you think the Fed, even though they're trying to tighten right now, they're going to eventually have to go back to more printing, then I think hopefully Bitcoin can make its way back and take out those highs a lot faster. Mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts on the Fed meeting from Gibran Khan? So the Fed, the Fed... And this started in November, right? The market was happy. Generally, you know, Bitcoin was pretty high in November. We were just at those highs. And the Fed had said, hey, we're going to taper and we're going to have to raise rates in 2022. What changed was they all of a sudden showed panic. And the panic came in the form of saying, not only are we going to taper and raise rates, but now we're going to run off this $9 trillion on our balance sheet. And what that showed is that the Fed realized is they were behind the curve and inflation was getting away from them. And I think that really freaked the market out. So, you know, the fact that Jerome Powell yesterday, when he when the statement came out at 2 p.m. Eastern time, initially the markets popped up. But when he came out and did his press conference and he started talking again about rolling off that balance sheet, that's when the market started to tank. So I think I think it's all about, you know, the Fed definitely showing that they missed the ball here. It, it was all about transitory for most of 2021. And now all of a sudden it's not. Um, I personally was talking about it not being transitory, and I'm not that smart. I mean, I know what I'm talking about a little bit, but how these guys should be the smartest people in the room, and they didn't see this coming. And again, one of the most obvious things for inflation was wages. I mean, here in the U.S., there's so many jobs right now, and people can't fill them. These companies can't fill them. So what do they have to do? They have to offer a higher wage and significantly higher. Well, you know, that's right there. That's the most, that's the biggest input cost to goods is wages. So it's going to impact inflation in a major way. And it's not going to be just transitory because a, a, a producer of a good can't pass on a wage increase of X percent in one day or one week or one month. They have to do small increments over the course of years. So it's going to keep inflation high, although I do think inflation comes back to about four to five percent. But but overall, yeah, I mean, the Fed meeting, they, they've got to they're trying to rein this in. And I think they're actually going to cause the, the economy to go into recession by late 2022. Nice. Is there any any assets you could buy or anything you could buy the, uh, for a recession? Like, what would you suggest people to buy right now? By the way, hit that like button. We're getting all these answers right here from Gareth. Hit that like button. Clap. Get up. Cheer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, although it's not the most bullish stuff in the short term, but yeah. yeah. So, so yes, I do think there are places to go. Uh, my favorite places, and again, this is not f f great with the, the, the crypto fan club, but Gold to me is is borderline breakout. The mm. pattern is is very reminiscent of the mid seventies to mid eighties period, mm. um, where it shows significant upside coming on gold. Um, do I think eventually Bitcoin will outperform gold x hundred times? Yes, I do. Just not until it's a more mature asset and it's had the flush out, right? So, so again, in the shorter term, over the next year, I've been buying into gold. Um, I've been also investing in foreign assets like like China, um, South America. Those areas have already been crushed. Um, mm. They, we've seen a massive. So since the Fed really got aggressive with COVID, we've seen such a massive inflow into U.S. equities from foreign um, investors and and domestic that it's really put a situation where there's an overabundance in the U.S. 
And now that the Fed is tightening, that money is going to go look for, for cheaper places to invest that are more lenient, like the, China, the Chinese government in terms of printing money and stabilizing their economy. So, so Chinese stocks, South American stocks, there's, I'm sure there's other, other governments or other, other countries out there that would be good as well. And then also gold right now. Are you also a silver guy or not a silver guy, just gold? I'm just a gold guy, to be honest. Yeah, so so silver is 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 more clouded to me because silver is is also an industrial metal and people don't understand that. But silver goes into cars, goes into I mean, there's so many industrial sides to silver that it makes it kind of a dual edged sword. So you have to for me, the reason why I'm not in silver right now is because I if if I think the Fed is gonna slow the economy, then that slows the demand for silver for cars and other things. And therefore, it may be a weaker play. Gold is really the pure play on inflation yeah. and, and ultimately what I think is coming. Do you think the fact that we've been trading sideways for so long, it has enabled the markets to build a lot of support? Maybe going sideways for so long was good. So going sideways is always a good thing, right? It's con it signals consolidation. Um, however, on the S&P 500, I don't have that at this time. Let me show you my S&P chart here, my spiders chart. So, so take a look at this chart, and this is a great representation of here was the COVID dip in March of 2020. And then basically the Fed comes out with these insane stimulus measures. The U.S. government started sending checks to Americans, and you basically got this massive upward move inside of this channel. What you can see recently is we just had a breakdown of that channel. So. What you can see on the longer chart is the longer term trend. So at the very least, this steroid push here is wearing mm -hmm. off now. So you should see equity markets come down at least back in this channel here for the long term growth. Um, so again, you know, for me, I, I didn't see, I mean, this is, this is classic top action here where you saw just slightly higher highs and then a bigger rollover. And once this upsloping trend line here broke, that's where things have gotten really messy for the equity markets. Got you. Uh, Byte asks, and, is, and uh, actually, sorry, cryptocurrency is dependent. Oh, sorry, that's a question. Is cryptocurrency dependent on the, uh, on the Fed in the USA? I think the USA is having a very small ice age of investors are compared to the rest of the world. Australia and a lot of other countries are supporting crypto. Yeah, I mean, I do think that, um, so, so to understand the question, I do think that the U.S., so the technology stocks in the U.S. are cl most closely tied to cryptocurrency because of the risk level. So again, that's that's kind of the hardest thing for a lot of crypto and cur currency investors to understand is that everyone wants to think, oh, it's independent. But really, the same money that's in crazy tech stocks like Tesla and these other names, that's the same money that goes into cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. So when those stocks begin to deleverage, the same thing starts to happen in cryptocurrency. I'm not really sure what's going on in other parts of the world. I haven't looked too closely at the, the Australian market, for instance, but I would assume it, it mostly is based off of, of what's going on in tech stocks in the US. Got you. And do you think projects like Solana, AVAX, L1s, uh, L1s basically, are they going to disappear? Uh, I honestly don't know for sure. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be when the dust settles, which ones work the best for transactions and can really come out on top. And again, I think I honestly think it might be too early to know for sure. The one I do think is going to survive and thrive is Bitcoin because of that adoption by the bigger institutional players and, and, sh and slowly more and more by other people. Um... Okay, please share your thoughts on FTM and Luna potential. Do, are, you, are you into these projects? No, I, right now I don't have any in Luna. Um, um, let me look at Luna here on the chart. Not a great intraday chart, that's for sure. But let's look at the daily chart. So check this out. I, I actually have some lines on this from when I was doing analysis. So it looks like Luna has more downside, but it will hit significant support around $51, $50 right here. You can see this pivot low right mm -hmm. here and then this upsloping low. So in terms of Terra Luna, um, this looks like a good support. It's almost there actually. That should be good support. Now, if it breaks that, that's where it gets in a lot of trouble. If it breaks below there, then you could easily head down here to sub $40. But again, this area right here will be significant support in the short term. Awesome. Top five stocks in crypto to buy right now. <laughs> Oh my gosh, um, crypto, 
Short-term trade Bitcoin, hopefully it bounces back into the low to mid 40s. Um, I would stick with that one for now. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of stocks, Alibaba, Baidu, some of the best of breed technology stocks from China, I think are the place to be. Um, and then gold and gold miners. So we pretty much agree on that, by the way. Um, I wasn't I wasn't so much into the uh, Chinese stocks and stuff like that, but um, when it comes to Bitcoin only, because because it, 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 people were asking me to do technical analysis on, on coins earlier on, I'm like, you don't need to just do TA on Bitcoin right now. Everything else will right. steroid up or steroid down. You're right, and you can look at all the cryptocurrencies and like the the way Bitcoin traded off of the Fed yesterday is how basically every single one did. So let me ask you a few questions about you, because you, you you're how long have you been trading for? Oh man, over 20 years now. So since the late 90s, um, getting into the market. So it's been a long time. My early years were very sporadic. I just didn't have a lot of money back then. So it was kind of, you know, get in a little bit, lose a little bit, have to re rebuild my account, you know, do it again. But, you know, basically starting in 05, that's really where it was 100% hardcore trading. What made you get into it? Um, I grew up in a, in a, in a, both teacher, both parents were teachers. Um, we didn't have a ton of money. My parents didn't invest. Um, at mm -hmm. that point, and and I was in high school at that point, and um, I got into the investment club, right? And I had a fake hundred thousand account. I'm sure we've all had that experience when we were younger, and it was with the dot coms, right? And and all of a sudden, I turned a hundred thousand into like two hundred, three hundred thousand in in a month or whatever it was, and it was addicting. It was like you know, even though it was fake money, I was like, wait a minute, you can really do this? Like, if this was real money, did I really, you know, like? And and at that point, I was like, all right. I have to get into this. I have to figure this out. Um, and, and I just, at that point, I knew what I wanted to do in life. It was, it was pretty crazy. So what about before? Uh, what about before you go? Okay, if we met in high school, we're sitting in the cafeteria, the high school cafeteria, we're sitting there, we're chilling, we're seeing some girls down to the left, I don't know what. Um, what were you like? What would I think about you? <laughs> oh, man. I mean, I was kind of the, the happy-go-lucky kid. I, th I think I was mostly friends with pretty much everyone. I went to a very small school. I only had about 20 people in my graduating class. So it was very small. Um, didn't have a girlfriend in high school. I was I was kind of a little on the shyer side when it came to that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I was kind of always in, in the, the hanging out area, but but not, I wouldn't have classified myself as the cool kid, but I wasn't like an outcast either. I was kind of just the, the go along with the flow kind of person at that point. And work-wise, what was your career-wise? Like after high school, what did you do before you got into trading? What was that journey like? So so I was dabbling in it, right? In college, I went to okay. college for, or, or, or university for education or for financial uh, economics. And, um, you know, same thing. I kind of dabbled in trading in, in college and kind of was trying my best to do it, um, not necessarily successfully at that time. Um, and then afterwards, I was like, okay, well, where do I get a job? And I didn't know how to become just a trader. You know, like no one taught me anything or anything like that. So I went to work for a company called MetLife um, and and I was in the kind of financial side of it, like financial planning, but I just hated it because it was, you know, first of all, I was low man on the totem pole. So I had to do all the cold calling. Oh, um, it really wasn't anything about like figuring out what stocks were best. All the investments came from higher ups and what the company wanted to basically push, right? So it, it had nothing to do with that. I stayed there one year and then I, my mom always told me you have to stay at a job for one year or it looks really bad on your resume. So I stayed there at my one year, I quit. And then I said, all right, I'm going to go into trading my own money. I only had about $10,000 at that time. And I went to a prop firm um, and I started to just trade and I worked side jobs to replenish my account and just kind of just burned it out for, for, for years at that point until I finally got a handle on it. How did you, how long did it take you to take a hand to get a handle on it? I mean, considering I didn't really have any guidance at the time or not much, I mean, it took me, I mean, let's see, graduated in 03. I mean, it probably took me about two to four years to really get to be consistently profitable. So, I mean, that's the the biggest thing about it is, and people should remember is you either pay someone to educate you and learn from someone or the market's going to make you pay. And generally the market makes you pay a lot more mm -hmm. money than what you would pay someone to learn. So, so I always recommend that folks is never go in with, especially one of the best things about me starting is that I didn't have a lot of money. If, you know, as a beginning trader, you always think you're going to hit a home run in every trade and you put too much money on the line and then you lose. Luckily, I just didn't have a lot of money back then. So so my losses, yes, to me, they were big. But in the scheme of life, they weren't epic. Yeah. And it takes a long time to learn. Technical. I, I see a lot of people thinking they can become technical analysts after, I don't know, two months. And, mm -hmm. and it does take two to four years. I mean, and it's not that long. 
I mean, it takes a doctor, what, six years? It takes right. a lawyer eight years or something like that. And two to four years is nothing, and you can make more money than both of them combined. Right? That's right. And so, you can do it from the, you know, you can sit behind at your house in your pajamas if you want and do it too. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I, mean, so I think that you're 100% right. That's such an important thing. I mean, you know, you, you look at the amount of money you can make, the freedom you'd have to travel anywhere with internet you can trade from. And, and you look at like a surgeon. I mean, think about can a surgeon walk in and one day and just say, hey, let me operate on this guy's brain. No, of course not. So you've got to learn and it takes time. Well, you can do it if you watch uh, you know, a, a, a crypto video on YouTube, then you can do it right after because you saw it, right? Yeah, so. That's simple, right? That's simple. <laughs> come on. I mean, come on. We have the internet now. I was an expert. Yeah. Um, uh, what, <laughs> are you success driven? I think so. I, I, I generally, you know, especially when it comes to trading, I was one of those people that I wasn't going to give up. I mean, there were there were periods where I, I was like, can I make it in this industry? Can I do it? Because I would just take a huge loss. And I was just so determined. I was like, I will, you know, there's no other job. I don't want to work for someone. I want to work for myself. I'm just going to continue to push. So I, I literally at points was working like three jobs on the side. And it was all in, I would literally try to save as much of that as I could. I would eat as little as I could at that point to try to build my trading count back up and build it bigger. And just, I mean, that was, it was just a one focus that I had. So I'm, I'm asking because I'm going to include this in my, some of these questions in my book, The Crypto Factor 2 or 3, um, where we try to find the mindset of the experts around the world or the blockchain in this case and see what similarities each person has. And I kind of see a lot of similarities already, so I'm really excited. Oh, that's cool. So how do you handle, have you had failures and how do you handle your failures? Oh boy, yes. So, I mean, we've, we've definitely all had failures. Any trader that tells you they didn't is definitely on the lying side of things, right? Yeah. So, so for me, it's, it's, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a logical, rational person, which I think helps me in, in trading and making unemotional decisions. But in my early career, for instance, I still remember vividly, you know, I had gotten my account to maybe $100,000 and I was day trading it at the time and I got in a trade and it just kept on going down and I kept on buying more and it just kept going down. Buying the dip. And at, the, at one point, I think <laughs> I think I wiped out about 75000 of that 100000 in one single day. And I, I remember getting up from the computer and I was in a haze. I was just like, I mean, it was, I was like, is this real life? Am I dreaming? Yeah. And then I went for a walk and I started to say to myself, okay, I have my health. I have, a, I have a roof over my head. I can make money back. I'm still young. I can keep going and I can figure this out. And it was, it was that rationalization that made me say, okay, you know what? Let it go back to work tomorrow. Let's start building right back up. And I, and I think that's important. I mean, if you get too emotional, emotion is the worst thing yeah. in trading, right? I mean, if you have emotion, you're almost always going to do the wrong thing at the wrong time. And the markets have algorithms that try to push you to those extremes. So you have to be ready to really just be like, all right, this is key. And, and by the way, the biggest thing to keep those emotions in check is to keep share size low. Don't buy too much. Don't buy too much cryptocurrency. As soon as you over leverage yourself, you're going to make a bad decision emotionally. Nothing wrong with just dipping a toe in the water. Then it's like, all right, you know, if it goes up, fine. If it goes down, sucks, but I can handle that. What do you do? You day trade or do you short, uh, do you swing trade? I do both actually. Yeah. So, so, you know, I found that day trading is, is a great way to generate monthly like profits to, to pay bills. I kind of look at it like, like that type of money. And then I, I use the swing trading side to, to generate wealth. So, so I'm a big fan. What I found also is that when the markets are great for day trading, sometimes they can be bad for swing trading and mm. vice versa. So as long as you're doing both, you can kind of generate money at some point. What are three pieces of advice you can give to people getting into trading right now? We're wanting Number to get one, into trade. start with so little money, right? So, so think about this, right? If, if, if I could create a trading room and I could train people right now, I would make them all strap on a heart rate monitor, right? And I would give everyone an X amount of dollars. We'll call it $100,000. And I would say, okay, keep your position size low. And when they get in a trade, I want to see that that heart rate does not change at all. And if it doesn't wow. change at all, that means you're doing the right share size. Now, if you, after a month of proving to yourself that you can make money at that share level or that money level, then you up it. At some point, you're going to have confidence. Your heart rate shouldn't change. If it does, you got to bring it back down. So, I mean, there are steps that you can take to really be determined to do the right amount for your level and, and you should be okay. So I think that's a huge one. Um, 
the other side of it is don't be afraid to take a loss. You know, usually my losses were ones where I should have taken it that day. I was like, oh, you know, maybe it'll go up tomorrow. And then it turns into a catastrophic loss. So I think that's an important one as well. Um, and then just be humble. You know, the market is always right. Um, as soon as we start getting, you know, as soon as we say, hey, we're, we're going to be right on this trade, it's usually the opposite. Usually that's our emotion showing itself. So I used to teach, I used to teach technical analysis in the Forex industry. And in the crypto industry, I gotta, I gotta ask one thing, and I don't know how you handle this. Do you, do you see a difference on what kind of stop losses you use? And do you use stop losses? I do use stop losses, absolutely. I tend to do small enough share size where at this point it allows me to add. So one of the biggest changes in my trading, and this is, this is for day trading and swing trading, is that when I'm isolating a level technically, and that's what I trade off of, right? So it'll be a support level, it'll be a double bottom or a gap fill or maybe trend lines. Um, I, I go in understanding that that level may not hold and it may go down past that level. So what I do is I say to myself, okay, Number one, how, before I enter the trade at all, I say, how much money am I willing to commit to this trade? And I have come up with a level, let's say $100,000. And I say, okay, well, at this first level, I'm going to just do a quarter of that, all right? And, and going in at a quarter, first of all, takes away the emotional risk of it. And also, it allows me to, to understand that if I'm wrong, I can add to it at the next technical level. And what I found is that, you know, let's say you have three or four technical levels. You know, you might break the first one, you might even break the second one, but by the third or fourth, it's so oversold, the technical level comes through and you're gonna get a bounce. So again, that's one of the ways I trade and it kind of makes me safer and, and it actually increases my win rate because of that. Um, in terms of stops, there always has to be an exit maximum where you have to go in saying, okay, if I'm down X amount of dollars, I gotta just cut it. Um, you know, it just depends on how much you're committing and how wide, but you should always go in ahead of time knowing that, right? You have to say to yourself, because as soon as you start getting in the trade and you haven't discussed that with yourself, you're going to start moving that target, right? <laughs> yes, of course. So what's it like being a day trader and a swing trader? So describe me your day. You wake up in the morning. What do you do? Um, so I wake up in the morning. Um, I've got kids, so I got to get dinner or breakfast on the table and a few other things. But as soon as I wake up, I'm checking my phone. I'm checking my, you know, what are the futures doing? What are the markets doing? Um, what what's moving on the day? What are cryptocurrencies doing? Are they are what's having big moves? And that's going to get me focused on where the trades may be for the day, both swing trading and day trading. So so I'm already focusing on that at nighttime. Even before that, I'm looking at what's been moving in a major way. Um, on a swing basis, because you don't necessarily know the next day for day trading, but on a swing basis, what levels are approaching and kind of have a game plan ahead of time. But really, you know, just being in tune as soon as you wake up, kind of living and breathing the market, seeing what's moving, that's going to give me my game plan for the day of what I'm going to focus on to trade. Do you have any uh, morning rituals or daily habits? Oh, man. Huh? Like, do you that, I mean, do that Wolf of Wall Street? Huh, huh, or anything like that? I don't have anything like that, but I do like to. So one of the things I would, and I recommend this for most people, I don't, I don't come in just a couple minutes. Now, crypto markets trading 24-7, right? But when it comes to the stock market, it opens here on the East Coast of the U.S. at 9.30 a.m. Eastern yeah. time. So, so I always want to be at least an hour ahead sitting down at my desk because you need to get settled. You have to get all your platforms opened. You have to kind of take, a, take an overview of what's moving. If you rush it, you're more likely to make a mistake when you come in just a minute before the open. But with crypto, again, that's not even an issue because it trades 24 seven. So just give yourself that time. Don't rush a trade right at the open because you might be missing something. Sit down, have some time to kind of go over things first. Do you prefer stocks or crypto? And where have you made more money? Um, overall, more money in, in stocks just because I've been trading stocks longer. Um, the other thing that, that is, for me, better than with stocks is that stocks move in different directions, right? You get earnings announcements in stocks. You get this, you get that. Just like what we saw with the Federal Reserve yesterday is that when the Fed says something, all the cryptos go one way, right? And then vice versa. So, so it kind of means that if you're trading multiple cryptocurrencies, it's all dependent on what the Fed says. There's not really a, a you know, they're all going to move in that direction versus with stocks. You can have a stock that reported great earnings for the day. It's up big, even if the markets are down. And, and there's just more opportunities, honestly, in stocks right now. Uh, so that's so definitely in stocks for now. Do you teach technical analysis? Do you teach trading? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So on, on the website in the money stocks.com and in verified investing crypto, which is the crypto website, um, we we basically or I basically do daily videos where I, I analyze the charts soup to nuts like this this pattern is forming this is the probabilities of a move here this is where we're going to look for support this is where we're going to look for resistance and I try to really detail out what I'm seeing and how my thought process works for people to kind of follow it but do you do you do like a, do you have like a course or people can hire you for a one-on-one -on -one or don't you do that um, I do do that. I'm one on one. Uh, I just did one last Friday, in fact, with uh, with a crypto investor. Um, it's very somewhat on the rarer side because it's it's not cheap. Um, the courses we do have on InTheMoneyStocks.com, there's a bunch of courses that are pre-recorded that I've done in the history, and so has my partner. And people can get those and watch them at their will. It's kind of like an on-demand thing. And they're just, I mean, it's amazing stuff going into cycles, going into time counts, you know, price pattern, like everything you could want. And and we really do get people saying that it's, it's changing their lives once they take this stuff. It's not the stuff you find in textbooks. It's not that. This is like the step beyond that. Right. And, and, and what's the price for those? Just so people watching right now, maybe they want to come over and, and check them out. Yeah. Do you know, um, do you know so, them by so heart? Have, or have, What's that? Do you, know, do you know them on top of your head? or? Yeah. So, so the best thing to do, right, is we have eight courses on our education, elite education page. And they range from $1,000 for one to probably about 200 for a different one. But the ones, honestly, the ones that are more expensive are the meat and potatoes, right? But what we do offer, um, and, I'll, and I'll throw this out there, it's more for our members, but I'll, I'll mention it here and, and we'll, we'll be more than happy to honor it, is that if people want all of the courses, we have a, we have a kind of an encompassing price of just $2,100 and you get access for a full year um, to every all eight of the courses there. It's probably about 35 hours of on-demand content wow. of hardcore education um, on charts. And um, it saves you about 3000 bucks. So I always, you know, you know, you know, if you're someone who wants to get into it, save yourself the money and just do the whole thing. Yeah, and and and, and it's better than the market taking more from you. It's, it's better to go in knowing risk reward ratios, yeah. how to make trades, how to do stop losses, and so on. It's most we people all know we can all lose that money on a, in a oh, split I lost second a lot. on a trade, so might as well put it. I, I lost a lot. I lo not not as much as I lost on NFTs. Mm. <laughs> but I lost a lot. <laughs> so what are three pieces of advice you can give people watching here? And you better subscribe down below and hit the bell notification button if you want more of these videos. Because I'm going to have Gareth back and he's Wonderful. going to be on time. And we're going to ask more questions. <laughs> because... was I, wait, wait, was I on time today, by the way? I, no, I you, were, you were half an hour late, man. Oh, all right. My the guy who books me told me three thirty. Sorry about no, that. Okay, it's okay. No, no problem. I, we we forgive you. We forgive you. I, I I was stuck. I was like, what do I say now? Sorry, buddy. <laughs> sorry to the audience. I apologize again. You know, I I have you know I go by what my people tell me, and and yeah, that's so I apologize out there to everyone. I I don't like to keep anyone waiting. I seriously. Cool, don't. cool, man. It's all right. So um, so three pieces of advice you can give people out there watching us right now. Oh boy, one, number one, be ready for a lot of volatility this year, right? So with the Fed doing what they're doing, it's not the Fed where they're gonna cushion every drop in the market and, and mm. cryptos are just gonna keep going up and up. You're gonna get big swings in both the stock market and in cryptocurrencies as they take the, the kind of the padding away from this market. So be ready for that. Um, I would recommend lowering share size or the amount that you're investing in crypto if you're trading it because Added volatility means added risk, which means you need to adjust the amount that you're putting in each trade. You'll still make great money because the swings are going to be so big, but make sure you don't overdo it by a big swing hurting you on a too big position. And lastly, you know, make sure you're always investing with money that you can afford to lose, right? I mean, you know, we don't know where crypto is going over the next couple of years. We don't know where stocks are going. You know, just be smart about it. You know, I don't want to hear anyone, you know, you know, you got to take care of your family and you make sure you guys have food on the table, a roof over your head, and then focus on learning. Education will save you a lot of money in the long run. All right. And what is the one question you wish people asked you but never do? Oh, my gosh. Um, I honestly don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> I That's ask everyone that. Everyone's like, ah, ah, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> so one, one last thing I'll say is, is, when we were at 65, 69,000 in November, and, and I was I was actually bearish, and, and I was in Dubai actually at the time in late October, and I said, you know, we were right at the breakout point above 65,000, and I was asked at an interview there in Dubai, should I, sh you know, what do you think about it breaking out? And I said, I don't trust it, be careful. And then the common response, and I got nailed on Twitter in this, 
and so many things. It's like, well, on-chain analysis is telling differently, right? On-chain analysis says this. And, and what everyone has to remember is that in the longer term, I think on-chain analysis is important. In the short term, fear always is more powerful. Fear and greed are the most intense things. Remember, investors are trading. So in the short term, this is why crypto is dumping out. It's fear. And, and yes, on-chain analysis down the line will be important. In shorter periods of time, it's not. Awesome. Thank you very much, Gareth. I'm going to leave the links down below so people can check out your channel. Check out Gareth Soloway. He's an amazing guy. Uh, subscribe to his channel. Subscribe to this channel. And I will see you guys next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Stick around.